Okay, so today I'm going to be reviewing my favorite book of all time, Peter Pan. I have an edition right there. I actually read from this edition this time and I annotated it again. This is my second, I mean, this is my first time annotating this edition. I annotated it the first time I read it as well in a different edition. I think this will be the one I pass on to my kids. Anyway, Peter Pan. Okay, well, first of all, I guess I'll mention this. I know that there are other reviews that a couple of people were waiting on in a holidays and the first 12 volumes of One Piece. Those are going up next week. I just wanted to dedicate a whole video to this book, as well as I really like the idea of the last video I post this year being a gush about my favorite story. I guess I'll also mention really quick uh, with Peter Pan, this is a book that I love so much and means so much to me, but it's not a book that I really try to push too much on my channel uh, because it's a story, it, it's an instance of, I think this is a great story. And I think that if you dig into it, if you read it at surface level, it's incredible. If you dig into it, it just gets better and better. And I think that it's a great book that a lot of people would love. But it's not a story that I push as much because it's a book that, it's one of those things where it was just, it's it's the perfect story for me. It hits me just right in so many ways that it's, it's the right book for me. But I also know that it wouldn't hit the majority of people on the level that it hits me. So this review is going to be less of a structured pros and cons discussing the story. It's not, it's not going to be like a normal review. It's really just going to be a gush about my favorite things about it. Uh, this is, this is a book and it was originally a play. It, this is a book that I think is so fascinating the deeper you dig into it. There's so many parallels and so much symbolism and so much to really dig into and theorize. It could mean this, it could be mean this. Um, and I think that's really fun to do. And while I think some of those parallels are really, really interesting, like the parallel between Wendy and Peter themselves and the parallels between um, Mr. Darling and Captain Hook and all these, all these things I think are really interesting. That's not what this video is gonna be. This video is just gonna be me talking about why I love it so much. And I, I don't even, I don't even know how to do it. I don't have notes. I just finished reading it again. I'm just gonna gush. So, oh, where do we start? I think I wanna start with the beginning because the first time I read this book, I thought that the first chapter was pretty rough. But now, I've read it three times now. Now on the second reread and then on the third reread, I love, <laughs> I love this first chapter so much because it's such a sassy opening to set things up. And um, I think in general, the the humor of this book is so sassy and witty. And I love the tone that this book takes. It's such a whimsical story that touches on really dark themes, but touches on them lightly in passing so that there's just a throwaway sentence that makes you go, I'm sorry, what was that? And, and if you think about it, and if you connect it with other throwaway sentences, then you really start to piece together a lot in this book. And I love that. I love that seemingly every sentence matters and that he chose to weave in these darker themes and to weave in these more complex issues, but he chose to do it in, in this throwaway way so that a kid could read this and have a fun adventure and an adult could read this and have a fun adventure, but also some really meaningful discussions. And I love that his tone was always light and airy and whimsical, even when talking about really heavy subjects. But um, it, it's, it's, it's this adventure, this fantasy that I get to float away in, but there's also so many lines that make me stop and really think for a little while. And I love this about this story. I also love our narrator. Um, our narrator is so, well, he's inconsistent, much like Peter. Um, 
one one theme about Peter Pan is that he's constantly changing sides. There's even a point noted in it whenever he's in a battle with the Lost Boys. Not with the, he and the Lost Boys are in a battle, and a lot of times um, Peter Pan will just randomly change sides and say, "I'm on this team now. What about you? What what team are you on?" And then one by one, each of the Lost Boys says, "Yeah, I'm I'm on the opposing team too." And then eventually the opposing team switches sides sides too and says, "Okay, I'm a Lost Boy." And 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 now they're continuing to fight because now they're all on the wrong side. And, you know, again, the whimsy of it, but this constantly happens with Peter where he's doing one thing and then he'll just change his mind. And now he's over here doing something actually quite terrible. The narrator is, is, is just like that. The narrator is sassy and rude and insensitive, but in this sweet almost way, in this casual sort of way that is charming, but at the same time, kind of jarring sometimes. He despises, he doesn't despise, he loves these children but hates them. He, this narrator, is constantly down on the kids for how selfish they are for leaving their parents and for leaving their home and not with a second thought about how this would affect their parents. And he just thinks they're so naughty and selfish for doing such a thing and for not considering them the whole time they're gone either, just having this complete confidence that they can come back whenever they want. And, and to the extent that he actually wants the children's window to be barred when they get back, and he wants their parents to be off on a vacation when the kids come back because it would serve them right to not come home to a welcoming family because they were so naughty and so selfish, which is, is very horrible to wish that upon children. Um, but he's just so critical on the kids for their selfishness and for, um, for their carelessness. Which is, which is just, it's just a trait of children sometimes. You know, kids are so focused on themselves, they're not gonna, and Peter is such a great example of that. Again, constantly, even when he, I'm jumping all over the place, I'm sorry. Even when he comes back after Wendy is grown and he doesn't even notice that she's an adult now for like a bit because he's so focused on himself that he, he, he doesn't even know. He's thinking so much about himself that he's not paying attention to the person that he's in the middle of a conversation with come to pick up to take her away. And again, the parallels, the parallels between the narrator and Peter and Peter and Wendy. And I just really enjoy the themes discussed and the overall tone in this entire story. It's the perfect balance of whimsy and carefree and, and excitement mixed with so much more to dig into and to discuss. He also, the narrator, um, is very inconsistent with the adults. He he tends to be very, he, he loves Mrs. Darling so much, but he also is so hard on her. At one point he says he despises her for having her windows open and for having the beds ready for the kids and for, um, for being who she is, for being ready for them when he wants the children punished and he despises her for that. But then two pages later, Later, he says, or depending on which edition, two pages in this edition, so one page in the normal size book, he says that actually I can't say that much bad about her because she's my favorite. And then, and then like one chapter later, she's a throwaway sentence when she dies. He just says she's long and forgotten, or she she's long dead and forgotten by now. And it's just like, <laughs> I don't know, I can't nail down this, this narrator. And I love, I love this narrator. It's the perfect personality to tell this type of story. Okay, now let's talk about Peter Pan because we've already talked about him a little bit, but I love this little character. I love this little guy. He comes into the kid's window because, was it Mrs. Darling or Nana? I believe it was Mrs. Darling. Closed the window and his, his shadow got caught and detached from him. And she took it and she rolled it up and put it in a drawer. And um, Peter then comes back to come and find it. He shuts Tinkerbell in the drawer and forgets about her. And then he tries to stick the shadow back on with soap because it's should be able to go back on simply because it's his shadow. It's a part of him. It belongs on him. And then he's crying because he can't get the shadow back on, which wakes Wendy. And then Wendy uh, stitches it back on for him. And then he's so happy that he forgets that he's supposed to be happy with Wendy and pretends that he did it himself. And he's celebrating himself for being so clever 
for having stuck the shadow back on that he didn't stick on. And then she mentions crying a page later and he, and he says, I, I don't cry, I've never cried before. Actually, I think it was something like, I wasn't crying because of this, I was crying because of that. Besides, I don't cry. And it just, oh, I love him. I mean, he's he's sweet and wonderful in that he wants to take these kids on an adventure and in that he looks out for the lost boys and that he takes, um, when children die, he takes them halfway there to make sure that they're not scared. Like there's so many wonderful things about him, but at the same time, he's horrible. I mean, as soon as, um, Wendy tells him the end of Cinderella, he gets so excited and he wants to rush back to the Lost Boys to tell them the ending of the story because he knows that they'll love it too. But then when she tells him, well, I have lots of stories, then he turns like, I don't know, he gets this look in his eyes and he like creeps toward her and he grabs her to just steal her away so that he can have all her stories. He kills with reckless abandon and with no emotion, including his own lost boys. There's a line in there that says that the number of how many lost boys there are fluctuates because when one of them breaks the rule and starts to grow up, he thins them out. He kills his own people who are dedicated and devoted to him. They're not allowed to know more than him, which means that the twins can't be individual people. They have to kind of just be the twins and leave it at that because he doesn't know what makes twins twins. He doesn't know what a twin means. And so they're not allowed to know because no one's allowed to know more than him. Oh, and when they're flying to Neverland, the kids, it's a really long journey and the kids get tired and they regularly will fall asleep and then drop out of the sky. And Peter will let them drop until the very last second and then swoop in and save them because it's a fun game to him. But his memory is terrible and he gets bored quickly. So sometimes he just leaves for a long period of time, which means that these kids, if they fall asleep, are in danger. And Wendy is even, she knows that he gets so bored with things that she even is concerned that at some point he's gonna watch one of them drop and never save them because hmm, maybe he's not interested in that game right now. But then we find that one time he's about to pass Wendy by and he's just gonna give her the time of day and then move on because he's forgotten who she is. And then she calls after him and he feels bad for forgetting her and tells her how, j just tells her, hey, remind me who you are if I ever forget you again and I'll always remember you. And then he feels so bad for forgetting her that he tells the kid kids how to lie on their backs on the wind so that they can sleep while flying. They, he knew this trick the whole time, but he chose not to tell them because it was more fun to him to watch them fall. I mean, like this kid, there's, there's so much to him. He's so good and caring and loving and so bad, <laughs> so thoughtless and selfish and evil sometimes, truly evil sometimes. But I love that about his character because it fits perfectly with the inconsistency yet consistency of this world. This entire world is all over the place, but at the same time always fits perfectly together. And same with Peter, he's he's up and down, he's hot and he's cold. He'll be friendly and happy and then he'll snap at you if he, suddenly you ask him the kind of question, like when she asked him where he lived and he, uh, or no, she asked him what his name was and it was short. And so he, he got really down on himself because it was a short name. And then she asked him where he lived and he gave some bogus directions. Second star, I don't remember. I should remember that line. It's one of the more popular ones. Second star to the right and then straight on till morning. Yeah, so he, he shouts out these bogus directions, which we learn later are bogus because he just made something up because he needed an, a an answer. And when he gets when he at, he gets asked a question that he doesn't fully know the answer to, he just like, he snaps and he turns rude and he gets frustrated. But then if somebody says, oh, I, I, I wasn't trying to corner you, I was just asking a question, then he's friendly and he's happy again. And his he's just, He's so all over the place and yet every single thing that happens with him is completely consistent with his character. Oh, I forgot another wonderful scene about him when they, I don't remember the context of this and I just read it. My memory is impressively bad for certain details. I believe, oh, oh, it was when, okay, so they were fighting the pirates and then they get in a pickle and they're gonna die and they're on a rock and the water's rising and uh, then, was it a kite? What was it? Something came down and was going to carry one of them away, but it was only strong enough to carry one of them. And so Wendy said, oh, we'll do a toss up for it. And Peter said, absolutely not. You're a lady. It's going to be you. And he's already tying her up. He's like tie, like tying the string around her so she can be taken away. And, and it was just like, it was never even a thought in him. And it was the most natural thing in the world for him to to do that. And that's, that's a theme for Peter is he has such 
love and respect for women in general, but for Wendy especially, he loves her so much. When Wendy mentioned that John thought girls weren't worth much, Peter's immediate reaction is to kick John so hard that he falls right out of bed while he's sleeping. He expects all the boys to serve her and to love her while she mothers them. And then in this instance of like, they're going to die, his natural reaction is, of course I'm gonna be the one that dies and you're going to be the one that's rescued. You're a lady and you're my Wendy. And so he sends her away <laughs> and she gets rescued and he just resolves to die would be an awfully great adventure, which again, it, he actually got afraid at one point. He was genuinely scared because he realized, oh, this is the end for me. But then he snapped back to joy and he was like, well, actually this could be fun, <laughs> which is so consistent with his character, his 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 bravery and and selflessness at times. And then even in the face of the utmost fear for him, he's just like, nah, actually this might be cool. But at the same time, he's not brave and selfless in other times. And it's just, but it always makes sense. It always perfectly works with his character. And that fits so perfectly with this world that we're in that's so nonsensical, but always fits so well together. Even in this scene, again, I'm sorry, there's no notes here. I hope you don't mind, I'm just, gushing. Even in the scene where he's near death, the way he gets out of it is that this never bird comes in and wants to save him because this, this is a theme in the book because he still has his first teeth because he's still so young. These mothers, these mother type creatures, including this mother bird, see him, they see a child and and they want to protect him. This is a theme throughout the book. Mothers love, mothers need to take care of children and to, and to you know, like be there for them, not let them hurt, not let them suffer. So this mother bird sees him and because he still has his first teeth, she wants to rescue him. And even in this moment where Peter is about to die and he's resolved that he's about to die, he still is so sassy and rude to this bird that he can't communicate with. Okay, moving on, I've spent a lot of time on Peter. I'm gonna uh, quickly hit on a couple other characters. I love Wendy as well. I love that um, she, even at the young age of two, when her mother says, oh, if you could always, if only you could always stay this age, and Wendy then realizes that she has to grow up. And then when she runs away to Neverland, um, she takes on this maternal role right away. She wants to provide for the kids. She wants to tell them stories. She wants to um, sew up their clothing and make sure that they're cared for. And it's this, this desire to grow up too fast, yet still reckoning with, but I wanna, I wanna live in Neverland and I wanna stay here forever. But then her devotion to her parents and her family, and it's just, there's a lot of conflicting things inside of her as well, which I love. And I love, I relate to her desire to grow up because I think a lot of kids probably relate to this, this when you're a child, you just want to be older, you wanna be more mature, you want the responsibilities. And her reckoning with, this theme of growing up with this reality that she has to grow up is also a really big theme in the story. Um, then you have the Lost Boys who I think, I think Barry did such a great job at characterizing them even though they weren't a massive part of the book. You know, Peter and Wendy are our main characters and then the darlings, you could argue, are, are secondary mains. But for the most part, a lot of the side characters are they're there and they have their lines and they have their scenes, but they're not as relevant to this, not as relevant. They're not as much in the forefront. And I think he did a great job of characterizing the Lost Boys so well in, in just the few scenes where they get to be a focal point. Which if you don't know, Lost Boys are little boys that have fallen out of their prams when their nannies, when their nurses weren't paying attention. And then if they're not claimed within seven days, they get sent off to Neverland to save on taxes or something like that. Which I, that, that alone is just like, oh, that hurts me. Like these kids got lost when someone wasn't paying attention and then they were never claimed. Their parents never came for them. So they get sent off to Neverland where Peter looks out for them and sometimes kills them. So these boys truly are lost. They're genuinely, truly lost because they they lost their families and they never got claimed. Their families didn't want them. And so they're in Neverland. And and the difference with the darling children with Wendy, John and Michael is that they, they are wanted, but Peter whisked them away to Neverland, which is actually a theme. Even at the end of the book, Peter constantly goes back. I mean, Peter, um, Wendy's mom 
Mrs. Darling was she went on an adventure with Peter when she was a kid. She already knew him and she kind of remembered him. And then Peter comes back for Wendy, but she's grown. So he takes Jane, her daughter, and then he comes back and takes Margaret, Jane's daughter, and he keeps going and he keeps taking girls. And it's because girls are far, are far too clever to fall out of their prams and they never are in, in Neverland, but Peter needs a mother, but he rejects mothers because his mother rejected him. Ooh! So he takes these little girls as his, to be his mother figure because he, Ooh! it's too hard, it's too hard. It's too much for me, actually. Anyway, what was I talking about? Barry did a great job of characterizing these side characters. So these little boys who are lost, he did a great job of making them like want a mother and want that that caring and really latching onto Wendy when she offers it to them, as well as giving them all such great personalities. And I feel like I know each of them so well just in the few scenes where they really get to be a focal point. Also the world building in this story is incredible. I won't touch on it too much because I've already been so long winded and I haven't even gotten to my favorite part of the entire story. But just these little, these little um, tidbits of the world of how uh, the stars can't talk to humans because of something that they did long ago and that's their punishment, but nobody really remembers what it was that they did. And the reason Peter is able to go into the Darling's house is because the stars are on Peter's side because they love adventure so much. And so the stars are what blow the window open for Peter to come in and the stars are the ones that tell him now. And um, you know, stuff like that. I, I, I love those little pieces of world building. And that's all throughout the book, just these little mentions of, oh, fairies are created because Every time a new baby laughs for the first time, that laugh breaks up into pieces and those pieces turn into fairies. Like, it's just like these little throwaway lines that all, when you piece them together, create this incredible, magical world. And I love it. I'll say this, I'll say this before we get into my favorite part of, of, of the story. There are definitely things that I don't love about this book. Like, I, I really don't care for some of the adventures they go on. Some of the adventures they go on are super fun and I'm completely into them. And some of them I don't care that much about. There's a few scenes as well that I'm just like, it's too much. It's too ridiculous. It's too, ugh. I think, I think the obvious scene to me, maybe not to you, is when Tink almost dies because Peter decides to drink the medicine and it's poisoned and, but, uh, Tinkerbell knows that it's poison because she happened to have heard Captain Hook muttering about it as he walked past. And so she knows that it's poisoned. And so then she just runs in and at the very last second puts herself in between Peter and the cup that he's about to drink. And she drinks the whole thing somehow very, very quickly <laughs> before Peter notices that none of it's hitting his mouth. And then she's dying and oh no, how can we save her? Oh, I know, maybe if all the children in the world believe in fairies, she could be saved. So Peter in Neverland randomly shouts into the skies, children, do you believe? And some of the children believe and some of them don't, but then a whole bunch of them start clapping and it's the clapping. Oh wait, I think even Tinkerbell says, maybe if they clap for me, I'll live. And so they all start clapping and then Tinkerbell's alive. And that like that scene, <laughs> I just don't like it. <laughs> it's just, there are a couple of scenes in the book that I'm just like, I love the whimsy of this world. I love the nonsense of the of this world, but that's ridiculous. Plus there's quite a bit of racism in this book. And I know that that's common in books of this age, in classics, in old books, but I still just really wish it weren't there because it, ugh, I, I hate reading it every time. Okay, let's move on to my favorite part of this book. So my favorite part is the ending. So in the end, Peter, my sweet, sweet, broken Peter, tells the kids that he doesn't want them to go home because he's confident that his parent, that their parents won't want them anymore because when he went home, after he went on a grand adventure in Kensington Gardens once, which Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens is a book that broke me like no other book ever has. It's his story, that little paragraph, that little bit of information that we get in Peter Pan, that's that story. And I, I Maybe that book is great, but I hated that book specifically because of how bad it hurt me. But anyway, you, you don't need it. You can just read this paragraph or you can read it and then just feel like you know Peter a little bit more and love him a little, a little bit tighter. But anyway, Peter, one day when he was a baby, he went on an adventure in Kensington Gardens and he came back and the windows were closed and the bars were on, were on the windows and there was a new baby sleeping in his bed. And because of that, he doesn't love mothers, even though he constantly is looking for a mother in Wendy and in Wendy's children and in every woman that came before Wendy or girl. Anyway, 
I could dig, I could dig so deep into all of Peter's mother issues, but I won't. He doesn't want the kids to go back because he doesn't believe that their parents will want him, want them, because his mom didn't keep her windows open for him. So, Wendy is confident. She is absolutely sure throughout this entire book it's mentioned, she's absolutely sure that their windows will still be open because she's so confident in her parents' love for her. And when Peter tells his story, she gets scared and she's like, we need to go home now. So the whole crew, Wendy and Michael and, and um, John and Peter, well, Peter initially isn't gonna go with them, but then after a whirlwind event, he does. And all the Lost Boys, they all go back with him. But Peter and Tink go ahead and when the windows are opened and Mr. and Mrs. Darling and their dog are sleeping in the nursery, hoping that they'll come home, even though they've been gone for a long time, the windows are open, they're sleeping in the nursery, the beds are, are turned out, I think is with the phrasing that was used, the room is ready for them. And when Peter sees that, he doesn't want to lose Wendy. <laughs> And so he closes the windows and bars them himself. But then he sees how badly uh, the darlings are hurting without their children and how badly they want them home. And so Peter does an incredibly selfless thing. And instead of making it look like they don't want them and keeping the family that he has stitched together, he takes the bars back off, he opens the windows back up and the kids arrive and they see that the windows have always been open for them. And so they come home and it's just this wonderfully happy reunion. They're so happy to see their children again. And then after, I can't remember, they counted to 50 or something like, no, I don't even, I think it was higher than that. After, after some time, the Lost Boys then enter the home the correct way, not through the window, because they want to make a good impression. And they arrive and they say, hey, we're from Neverland too. We don't have a family. And, um, and they ask if they could be adopted. And Instantly, Mrs. Darling says yes, and Mr. Darling wants it too, and they all dance around the house and they find um, enough places to put beds so that they can adopt all six of the Lost Boys along with their three children they already have. And it's just like, without hesitation, this family is just like, you need a home too? You need parents? You need a family? Yes, of course. <laughs> There's no question about it. I think that the ending of this book, not to mention all of the complexities that come with Peter and his position. The, the way that Mr. and Mrs. Darling are, especially Mrs. Darling, it just, it's such a reflection of, of a very specific part of my heart. The fact that their kids left and, and decided to go do this thing without a goodbye, without a, hey, see you at, at this point, without a thought for them. It's never a question that their windows would always be open, that the beds would always be ready, that they would sleep every night in the nursery ready for their kids to come home if ever they they would. And this this theme throughout this book of of a mother's love, of of their windows always being open is just such a reflection. It's just, it, it hits me. It hits me hard because my windows are always open too. And and the fact that he took it then one step further and that, tagummit, the fact that Barry took it one step further and that when the six lost boys who are truly, truly lost, the fact that they came in and asked if they could be adopted and without hesitation, they are just like, yes, of course we'll be your parents too. And happily danced around the house looking for places to put beds so that they could so that they could now have nine kids without question of, you know, there was, there was in the first chapter, there was the deliberating of, oh, can we even afford kids? And then at this point, they're just like, that's not even a concern. We just, these kids need a home. Of course we'll be their home. And so it's this really heartwarming, beautiful ending, but at the same time, so heartbreaking because Peter's still outside the window. And when he, he, <laughs> doesn't knock on the window, doesn't open the window, but just acts like he's gonna pass by, but kind of brushes it lightly so that Wendy can see him pass by and can call after him. And she does, and then he stops and, um, and she says, don't you wanna ask my parents the same question that all the Lost Boys asked? And um, Mrs. Darling immediately reaches out her arms to him and she's like, of course we'll take you too, but he rejects her. And decides to go back off to Neverland by himself. But first they, they create this arrangement that once a year, she can, Wendy can go off with Peter Pan and spend a week with him in Neverland and then come back. 
And he starts to forget her. He stops coming back until she's an adult. And then we've kind of already covered that. He comes back as she's an adult. It doesn't even notice she's an adult. Then he's terrified of her as an adult. But then he notices that Jane is there. So he takes Jane and comes back for her every week until he doesn't. And then he takes Margaret and, you know, it, it continues on. And, um, you know, he just, again, I can dig into that so much deeper <laughs> if, if, if I would, but I think I've cried enough for one video. I love this book because the level, the, the amount of nonsensical and, and whimsy and just beautiful world that nobody really understands like Peter does is just, it, it just, it speaks to my heart somehow, you know? It just, it fits me so perfectly. The many, many levels and, and the many, many faces of Peter are so fascinating to me. And I love each time I read it, trying to catch one little bit more of who he is and understand him a little bit more because he's so, he's so complex. And I think if, if you read the book quickly, you might miss it. But if you take the time to really pay to, and you know, if you read the book quickly and you didn't like it, that's you know, fine. It's totally okay. I get that this book isn't for everybody. But if you do, if you take the time to read it really closely and, and to take his little pieces of who he is and put them together, you come away with uh, this amazing broken child. And his story is so sad. And I feel for him and I hurt for him, but at the same time, I love Mrs. Darling for how much her windows are always open and how desperately and truly she loves her children and how her windows are open for every kid. It just, it speaks a lot to me, obviously. When I was growing up, um, I didn't grow up in the best area and a lot of my friends didn't come from great homes. And my house was always the place where everybody came. And, you know, my parents were always the parents that, like my friends always considered my parents their parents. I, I even remember several times when uh, my brother's older than me, when my brother's friends were old enough to be driving, I would go to sleep at night. In the morning, I'd come downstairs and there were two or three kids asleep on our living room floor just because they needed some place to be that night. And um, my parents would come downstairs and see kids in their house that they didn't invite and they would wake them up, tell them to go brush their teeth and take a shower and they would have breakfast for them and they'd hang out with us for the day. And, you know, I, I, I wouldn't do everything exactly the way my parents did it, but the heart of, of, of this, the way I grew up seeing that my parents, their windows were open for every kid, I... I mean, like, that's my heart, you know? And I see that in Mrs. Darling, and I, it's, it's who I want to be, too. All right, I'm done with this. I've cried enough. Anyway, that's why I love Peter Pan, for a lot of reasons. Actually, this barely scratches the surface of why I love Peter Pan. I could dig a whole lot deeper, and we could talk for a whole lot longer, but I'm sure it's enough for everybody. <laughs> I'd love to continue chatting with you about this in the comments. I post videos every Tuesday through Friday. I'll see you guys again soon. Bye.